You're listening to the Huddle Up Podcast with Chad Jensen and Zach Kelberman. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com and sound off. And now it's time to drop some knowledge. So welcome in, everybody. It's the Huddle Up Podcast presented, as always, by Mile High Huddle. Powered by Blue Wire Pods, I'm your host, Chad Jensen. With me is my fellow football priest and the deputy editor of MileHighHuddle.com, Zach Kalberman. Zach, Broncos, hey, game week. They've gotten back to uh, they've gotten back to work today. They got to practice and a little bit of news. There's a couple of news uh, points we need to discuss tonight. Uh, the first being the Denver Broncos have announced their captains. Now, in days of yore, the first two years that Fangio was here, he didn't like the notion of uh, season-long captains. He wanted the voting to be on a game-by-game basis, which to me just seemed like way too much work, <clears throat> way too much, uh, not the juice not being worth the squeeze. But this time around, they actually he allowed the players to vote for season-long captains. Those captains were announced tonight. I'll let you, if you want to, Zach, announce them. But why do you think Fangio changed his perspective on that? trying different things out in his third season. I mean, trying to remedy past failed approaches. It might be a little bit of grasping at straws because I don't think captains are going to lead to more victories. It's it's kind of a ceremonial thing. It's kind of just a, a nice thing for the respected players on the roster to have. And they were voted on by their teammates, so it kind of exonerates Fangio from the Teddy Bridgewater situation of showing favoritism. It's Fangio's way of saying, because Teddy Bridgewater is a captain for the season, his way of saying, listen, guys, it wasn't just my job status that got Teddy the job. It's that the fact that he's come into this locker room and his teammates and the Broncos players have rallied around him and he stepped up as a leader and he's earned that C patch. It, it, there's not too su- many surprising names on this six-player list. I think it's a little excessive, though, having six captains on a 53-man roster. I did the math. Almost 9% of the roster are captains. I mean, I understand one for offense, defense, special teams, but six The only one that kind of stood out to me, I know it's voted on by his teammates, was Kareem Jackson. This is a guy who is literally in his final year here. This is a guy who was barely brought back. His option was turned down, and he was re-signed at a lower rate by George Payton. Then they drafted two safety to take his job in the future. I understand he's popular, but I feel like that title should have gone to maybe a younger player. They had Simmons and Kareem Jackson and Von Miller on defense. I mean, that's two veterans, three veterans. Maybe one guy like Shelby should have gotten yeah, it's uh, hey man, it's it's a widget, right? It's like we're gonna overanalyze this. We can, but it's like okay, I the, the the progress here, in my opinion, is that you named captains for the long haul, which I think takes away some of the. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it just seemed to me, Zach, that it has always been kind of a pain in the butt to decide each. It's just one additional thing Fangio had to check off his docket of uh, crap to do each week. Who's going to be the captains this weekend? All right, let's figure that out. It's like, no, dude, just focus on the opponent. Name your captains. Know who the leaders of your team are before the season starts. Allow the locker room to coalesce around those guys and go play football. And so to me, I take it as a silver lining, positive development. Um, But I am always going to wonder why Fangio suddenly decided to shift his philosophy on that. Not Not going to worry too much about it. But it is interesting, of course. I mean, hey. If you're going to name a season-long captain, with very few exceptions, the starting quarterback is going to be among them. It would be interesting, Zach, if Teddy struggles, Drew gets put in. That might cause some awkwardness, but that's a bridge they cross if and when they get to it this year. What do they do? Do they unstitch the C-patch from Teddy and give it to Drew if he ends up starting a game? I was thinking to myself, what if the players would have voted for Drew Locke? to be one of the captains, and Teddy would have been left wanting. I'm not worrying about it too much. I'm not really that high on captains. I feel like it's more of a high school thing or more of a college thing. I mean, go out, play football, and win football games. I don't really care about the ceremonial parts of it. I want to play football. I want to see results. We still have a lot more to get to tonight. Um, I want to talk about who returned to practice today, what that means for the season opener, which is – just a few days away, Sunday. And it's a really weird East Coast start time. Usually when a team goes to the East Coast to play, 
on a day game, right? It's usually 11 mountain time, 1 p.m. Eastern time start. In this case, it's like a 2 p.m. mountain time start in New York. Kind of bizarre. Hopefully that favors the Broncos a little bit, Zach, because that early East Coast morning juju, it did seem to hamper them with the exception of the uh, Carolina game last year. Well, you want to talk about Juju, isn't the last time they played the Giants that wonderful VJ week five coming off a of bye week, Sunday night football, and they got absolutely trounced? I think the Giants were winless. So, again, it's all ceremonial stuff, start times and captains. It doesn't really matter if the game's played at 2 o'clock mountain or, or midnight mountain time. I want to go out there and beat New York and start the season off right as they should, 1-0. and oh. Appreciate that super chat, my friend. Who was that, by the way, that just jumped in early? I want, we'll shout him out here. Aunt Andre, thank you for a super sticker. I'm told it's a uh, it's the acid hippo. So props to you for getting that, my friend. Um, Lawrence says they made a statement with that. Yes, they did. <clears throat> Guys, we're going to get to a lot more with the chat, yeah. what's on your mind, some of the news. We got to say thank you, though, to the uh, presenting sponsor of tonight's live stream pro- uh, podcast, which is BetQL. Now, listen. When it comes to football nowadays, hey, fantasy football, that was, you know, that kind of greased the wheels, Zach, for uh, sports betting to kind of come back onto the American landscape, be, be accepted uh, the, for the most part. I mean, there's a few states that haven't gotten their you know what together, but it's widely accepted. NFL, Denver Broncos have partnered with specific sports books. BetQL, they want to help you to get an advantage over your sports book. You need to download the BetQL. Uh, app, which is the only app you're going to need to make smart bets. Their best bets computer model, they scan over 350,000 unique bets per year to give you a best bet recommendation for every game across all major sports. And it gives you the reasoning behind why you should be placing that bet. And their model covers everything from spreads over unders, uh, player prop bets, and you don't want to use the model, you prefer to do that research yourself, you know, if you're a beautiful mind when it comes to sports gambling, BetQL has all the necessary tools for your research needs. Zach? Yeah, a couple other things that jumped out to me, Chad, about BetQL. There's sharp data so you can see exactly who the pros are backing and who they're betting against and kind of stack up yourself against the professionals. Also, line movement so you can jump on betting opportunities in real time. You don't have to wait. There's no delay. There's no lag. It is real time whenever you want to do it. Team summaries highlighting previous success against the spread and the over-under. So kind of like a, a history that you can look back on to judge and weigh your bets against. Really helpful tool there. Also, team lineup breaking news and injury status updates. That's pretty standard. I mean, every betting uh, site should have that, but BetQL goes in-depth with that and gives you the tools you need and the information you need to stack your best bets. And also, finally, you can save all your picks in one place to track your success and winning streaks as well as your rank on the leaderboards so you always know, no matter if you're betting locally, regionally, nationally, internationally, you'll know who you're up against and where you stack up. That's right. So what do you do? You go to the App Store or Google Play, Uh, ASAP and you download BetQL. You can also try uh, head to our actual unique URL, which is try.betql.co slash MHH. That's try.betql.co slash MHH. To get started right now, we got the season opener kicking off Thursday night. If you enter the discount code MHH at payment, uh, you get a, uh, at checkout, pardon me, you get a 25% off on their subscription offerings and you can fill out all that you pick all the all the different tools you need to rock it yeah and after you do that guys i want you to do a couple more things for us there go to uh make sure you check out the bet mgm offer in the description in order to receive a free year of betql a free year of this service if you check out uh the link in the description also check out sportsbook offers page if you live in one of the eligible states to claim free offers upon signing up at one of the many sports books uh listed in front of you and finally guys don't miss out on the chance to beat your sports book this football season that's right guys all right betql.co uh try.betql.co slash MHH. Use that code MHH at checkout for 25% off their subscription offerings. We appreciate them supporting the Huddle Up podcast and Mile High Huddle. Speaking of support, Zach, here is Kiaka, a bona fide superstar from Hawaii. He's hanging loose. He's having fun. He's feeling good. 
And we're looking forward to seeing you in just a couple of weeks, dog. He says, my brothers and Broncos country. I hope everyone is doing awesome and is healthy. I'm in Denver until the MHH meet and greet. So pumped for this season and to meet our MHH Ohana. Love. That's cool, man. Hey, that's cool, man. He's not just flying in, flying out. It's not a surgical strike. He's coming to uh, settle in and, and uh, soak up the mile high uh, culture. Yeah, Akiaki, I can't wait to meet you. In just a few weeks now, we're under three weeks away from the MHH meetup. Week three, guys, uh, home opener for the Broncos against the Jets. Kiaka, I will buy you happily a, a shot of liquid optimism for that game. We appreciate you. It's just so, um, what's the word, encouraging. It's just really cool to hear how many people, I mean, we have a lot of our listeners, obviously, Zach, are in the state of Colorado. They're in Denver for obvious reasons but as we say on this show Broncos country is not a geographic location it is a state of being it's not limited to a single individual spot on the map we've got listeners from all across the world and Zach it has been stunning to me to hear how many of our great listeners community members are making the trek specifically obviously they're there to go support their team but they're there to come see us participate in the hangout the meet and greet we're going to be doing with the big mhh tent that's going to be hard to miss outside the game tailgating leading up to kickoff so it's just really cool we can't wait to see you guys it's wild even if for those who live in denver and live locally for you guys to come out and meet us and take your time we we appreciate that but we have people coming out of state we have people coming out of country. We have people coming East Coast, West Coast, every coast you can imagine, every border you can imagine. And Kiaka is right there at the front of the line in terms of out-of-market Denver Broncos fans that we want to see at that game. It would be cool to see Michael Ronquillo there as well. Thank you for the stars, brother. Remember, guys, we hit our goal on the Von Miller giveaway, the jersey. We're going to do the raffle Wednesday night, and everyone will get to see who won that particular uh, giveaway Plus, we have a few consolation prizes for those five names who finished in the top five. And then starting as of yesterday, all right, we're doing a new goal. We'll unveil what that is Wednesday night. But every super chat, every star donation up to this point is all going to go toward that. You're in the running already. All right, we'll unveil what that is. But it's going to include both Facebook and YouTube. We don't want either one of our core communities feeling left out in this giveaway. It's going to be really cool. So Michael Lawrence Rivera on Andrew Marl. Appreciate you guys. You've already got your, your name in the, in the hat, so to speak. And here's Justin Fogel, Zach. Thank you, Justin. He says, Hey, this is my first live pod in a long time. I can't wait to meet you guys in three weeks. Go Broncos. Very cool. Zach. Very cool. Uh, Anthony Edwards. Appreciate that generosity. My friend. Thank you. He says, I saw in an interview with Barkley and Galladay, they look real nervous when asked how their offense would start against the Broncos on Sunday. Thanks for everything you do, guys. Yeah, I mean, I wonder why. on paper, it's a formidable defense, but let's just hope that that, in theory, on paper, you know, look, translates to the field. Well, if you think the Broncos are in shaky hands, imagine being a Giants fan or a Giants player on that offense. They're led by Daniel Jones at quarterback, and their offensive coordinator is Jason Garrett. I mean, there's not many OCs in the NFL, I would say, that are objectively worse than Pat Shermer, but I think Jason Garrett is more conservative and worse overall. So, yeah, I mean, Barkley is coming off a season-ending significant injury. He's not going to be 100%, even though he'll play. Galladay is Galladay in that offense. He'll be hamstrung by his quarterback play. I believe Evan Ingram is not playing. I think he's a long shot, the tight end for the Giants in this game. That's going to benefit the Denver defense. Uh, I just think uh, if they just play up to their potential, they should stifle Jones and company. And it's encouraging to hear overall, talking about the Giants game, that Noah Fant, Bradley Chubb returning to practice today. Now, exactly how much they're going to participate Sunday in New York, only time will tell. But I think you're going to, I think they're going to both play as as much as they would as if they were, hadn't been a little bit banged up this past week. I'm kind of worried about Chubb. I'm not going to lie. He was doing some things off to the side today. He wasn't fully integrated in practice. Like Noah Fan got more practice time in, in full team period. It seems like Chubb's ankle is still giving him problems, and I think he'll play, but. I don't think he'll be 100%, and I still blame the Broncos, Chad, for waiting until May to have that surgery done on his ankle. It's really bizarre. It, it's hard to uh, reckon and wrap your, your brain around it, 
Fangio, I don't think he's ever really been challenged on that. Now, you know, not that it's necessarily his purview uh, to, uh, I guess at the end of the day, you know, the buck stops with him as, as it relates to the team and the players, but why the medical staff hoped that a little R and R would make the ankle problem that he dealt with late last year, which what caused him. I mean, remember last we heard from Bradley Chubb, he was emotional uh, just w- named to the Pro Bowl, voted to the Pro Bowl. This wasn't an alternate. This dude was straight voted to the Pro Bowl. Great for him. And then nothing, right? For two games, he he had to sit on the bench to end the season because of that ankle. So you would think the Broncos would have been more on top of that, monitoring it instead of waiting all the way till you kick off the offseason training program to see, all right, how is it looking like? I don't know. It just feels like someone missed the mark there. Who it was, I don't know, but it's hopefully it doesn't end up being unfortunate. Exactly. I hope come September 12th, come next Sunday or this Sunday, I can't believe we're in game week. It's still, I'm not, my brain's not wired to think that way yet. Uh, It's a non-factor. It's a non-story and he'll have a great season. I hope he stays healthy. I pray he stays healthy because I just want one season, Chad, uninhibited Vaughn and Bradley Chubb, bookending quarterbacks. Here we have a man, a student who can tap his head and rub his belly at the same time. Christian, What's good, buddy? He says, I'm watching while bagging groceries at work. Hashtag MHH from Michigan. Very cool, my friend. Thank you for the super chat. Peeling off a couple of bucks from, I'm sure, the uh, returns on your labor there, bagging those groceries to support the cause. Great to have you. Appreciate you, Christian, as always. Andrew Baker, another great supporter. Thank you for all the stars, my friend. He says, I think our offense will be fine as long as Teddy doesn't turn the ball over, which he had almost as many turnovers or giveaways as Locke last year. But, hey, that conversation is over for now. Hashtag MHH for life. Denver Broncos for life. Yeah, dude, you know, Eric Trickle, it was actually quite interesting because Eric and Lance on Dove Valley Deep Divers, they have challenged the trope that um, Teddy is not aggressive, right? There's And, and we've lamented it. I've talked about it when I – Uh, have mentioned that, you know, I talked to a few people that have covered Teddy and some of his different stops. And when I asked, you know, Hey, what, you know, what do you expect? What was your takeaways from your time covering Teddy? The one thing they all said without fail was leader, big time leader, charismatic, magnetic leader. And you're going to pull your hair out wondering why he doesn't push the ball. Well, Hey, Eric Lance, they've pointed to some uh, advanced analytics. I don't pretend to know them off the top of my head, but that would, uh, maybe counter that notion that Teddy is not aggressive. However, Zach, the one thing that Eric's film breakdown, he's basically, he's basically breaking down each and every one of Teddy's interceptions in Carolina last year, of which there were 11. All right. Drew threw 15. Was it 15? Yeah. 15. Teddy threw 11. And just like a sack, every interception has its own little story, right? It does. It's not always the quarterback's fault. Sometimes it's the receiver's fault, or sometimes it's the O-line's fault, or sometimes a DB just makes a dang good play, etc. But Zach, one of the takeaways, all right, of that film breakdown is that yes, there really is some lack of arm strength there that you kind of have to figure out how to mitigate schematically if you are Pat Shermer. I don't want to go backward and talk about, you know, Locke versus Teddy or Teddy's pass with Carolina or the Saints. I'm looking forward forward to week one to the Giants game. I would be really surprised if they came out and were pass happy. I would be really surprised if they came out in week one, no less, against a defense that is a little stingy, at least it was last season, and they were throwing the ball around 40, 45 times. I think in week one, maybe even through the first quarter of the season, it's going to be a heavy dose of Melvin Gordon and Javante Williams, and hopefully they work in succession. They work as a duo, and they are effective on the ground to take the pressure off Teddy Bridgewater. I would be shocked, to an extent, Not with Pat Shermer, nothing's ever truly surprising, but I would be shocked if it was a Teddy-heavy game plan in Week 1 at New York. It really doesn't need to be. As much as those weapons are there, teaming, the arsenal... Uh, you don't really need to put it all on Teddy. Let Melvin, let Pookie, let those guys do some heavy lifting. Jason says, I hope Teddy realizes that checking it down isn't going to be the answer. Air it out, even though throwing it 40 plus times may be out of the question. Right. See, here's the thing on, I get what you're saying, Jason. Here's the thing on airing it out. You don't need to, nor should you do it willy nilly. 
you have to be strategic in how you do it. All right. Good example of that is the John Elway to Rod Smith, 80 yard touchdown off play action in Super Bowl 33. Our Facebook subscribers or supporters over there who are with me today for Broncos book club. I detailed that out in, in that it wasn't just a spontaneous, Oh, cool. This play worked. Yay. Touchdown Broncos. Even though that was the pivotal game changing moment that swung everything Denver's way in the Super Bowl against the Falcons, that play had a huge backstory tactical. I mean, there was just a lot of strategy and a lot of different dominoes that had to fall in a row for that, those stars to align perfectly the way they did. And I want to see that. I want to see some of those strategic, you know, shots. It doesn't need to be every other throw does not need to be an 80 yard bomb. And in fact, you don't even need to connect on half of them. Great. Great. If you could, it's more simply the threat, where you're yes. in the defense's head thinking this could happen. Exactly. Yeah, that's a really, really great point. You have to keep the defense honest, and you can't have them stacking the box on every down and daring Teddy to beat you uh, because more than likely with his arm talent or lack thereof, he just can't and won't be able to. Um, but it also depends on game flow. So if the defense comes out in New York and they're just shutting them down they might be even forcing turnovers, might be even scoring on a pick six or a fumble recovery. If the Broncos are comfortable with how their defense is playing, again, I'd be really surprised if Teddy was throwing it around MetLife Stadium. Even though they have a bevy of weapons, Chad, at least starting out, let the running game do the heavy lifting and hopefully coast to victory. Again, Claude, thank you for those stars, my friend. Um, you to man. He says, I have faith in Teddy and his arsenal of weapons. I have faith in our defense and their ability to smack people in the mouth. What makes me nervous is a lame duck head coach and his offensive coordinator. Great pod. As always, fellas, Broncos country. If you haven't become a supporter, he's telling you get on that less than cost less than a cup of coffee each month. Hey, we appreciate that. Claude, seriously, that testimonial, uh, Zeus checking in from the top rope as he is want to do. Hope you're doing well, bro. Hope you're doing well. Five bucks a month. Go to our Facebook page, Mile High Huddle Facebook. Big blue button at the top. Become a supporter. You get access to Kelberman's Corner every Sunday. You get access to Broncos Book Club every Saturday with yours truly. Today was a reschedule. I did Broncos Book Club today because I was on vacation Saturday. And the Trickle Zone every Saturday, Zach. Less than a gallon of gas as of today for VIP instant exclusive access to our programming and content. I promise you guys it's worth every penny. Shout out to Big Earn. Good to see you. Shout out to Andre Williams, who says uh, loves the show. First time watching live, but he listens to each and every one. Very cool. Um, Here's one from DeAndre on Facebook. Appreciate you, DeAndre. Uh, He says, Game week, guys. I like that idea of letting the players choose the captains and this showing favoritism for Teddy and Locke was sabotaged. He didn't get a fair chance. Is the Locke fans being salty? Yeah, for now, bro, that's all water under the bridge. We got fish to fry, right? The Giants being that fish. So the whole sabotage, favoritism thing, everyone's got an argument on that. Some have merit, some don't. Bottom line is Teddy Bridgewater is your starting quarterback. Close ranks around this cat. And I'm not speaking to you specifically, DeAndre, because I know you are behind him. I'm speaking generally. And uh, focus on, hey, what is it going to take to beat those New York football giants? And after you fry that fish, you have a cat to fry in the Jaguars. And after that, you have an airplane to fry in the Jets, Chad. You see where I'm going with this? Until Teddy gives me a reason to start talking otherwise, he's the Broncos quarterback. And I really want to start putting to rest, and I mean this genuinely, the lock, Bridgewater, sabotage, conspiracy theories, tinfoil. We've spent months and months covering that. We're looking forward to the regular season six days away. And Chad and I and a lot of other people have very high hopes tied up in this team for this year. Uh, Andre's like, hey, I don't understand why PS2, Patrick Sertan, the second, is not starting. Dude, It's you're Where? not even going to be worried about starts when it comes to PS2 because he's going to play starter snaps. So I wouldn't worry so much about whether or not, you know, he's, he's racking up starts quite yet. He is a rookie. He's going to play a lot. We know, as we talked about last night, what his role is going to a big part of what his role is going to be anyway, shutting down tight ends. Michaela, the Duchess in the house after a record, record night. Love you. Appreciate you. you. She says, I am worried about opposing teams loading the box. What do you guys think? I'm worried about it too. I'm not going to lie. 
I think this team has the offensive line talent and the running back talent to still win in many of those situations. But teams, that's why you have to – and again, those deep shots, it doesn't have to be always a deep shot that forces a defense to kind of bring that safety back out of the box, right? Just connecting on a play-action fake will get in their heads. So it's just a matter of, hey, when they load it up to stop the run, which I promise you, that's what the Giants are going to do early in that game and just see if Teddy can beat them. All he has to do is convert one or two of those, even if it's a freaking slant, dude. Even if it's a a play-action boot rollout throw to Andrew Beck coming out of the fullback backfield for a five-yard game, just connect on those, make them pay a little bit for selling out, and then you get them on their heels and and it kind of levels that playing field. But it's a concern, Zach. What do they say? What's the best way to beat the Blitz? is to run right at it. So if you have a strong running game, it'll take the pressure off Bridgewater. It can help beat the rush. It can really keep the offense figuratively and literally moving forward every single snap. But I want to be fair to Teddy or whoever's playing quarterback at various points this season, whether it be Locke or Bridgewater. It's not just on them. If the running backs alone don't get going, if they underperform, if Melvin Gordon doesn't live up again to what he should be is a great running back, not a good running back, If Javante is slow to get going or whatever happens to him, that's on them. If the offensive line isn't creating holes, that's on them. Teddy is not going to do it alone, so he has to get help from the players around him. That's why there's 10 other players on the field with him, but the running game is paramount to the Broncos having a top 16 offense. I think that's the barometer, Chad, we're all looking for. And we would have said that with Locke or Teddy. Just a top upper half offense in the NFL and pair with that defense, you'll make the playoffs. And I think having a running game is crucial and central to hitting that mark. Ronnie says, and thanks, Ronnie. I'll be in touch with you tomorrow, by the way. He says, I read an article about the analytics of Bridgewater succeeding in a dink and dunk offense this season. Not sure if either of you guys wrote the article. No, that was Tom Hall. If you didn't, did you read it? Yes, I did. If the Broncos offense utilizes a dink and dunk, can they succeed with it? I mean, it is it's all about moving the chains, right? Yeah, and that's the main gist of Tom's article is you know, when people talk about dink and dunk, it's not sexy, right? Um people the Kansas City Chiefs are a good example. Alex Smith was perceived as the dink and dunker. But the bottom line was he could move the chains, right? When the chips were down, Whereas Pat Mahomes was this, you know, big freaking swashbuckling gunslinger making big play after big play. That's what sells tickets. That's what gets butts in seats. That's what gets butts in front of couches watching network broadcasts of these games. But that doesn't mean Dink and Dunk can't work or doesn't work. So, Tom, I'm trying to remember the takeaways specifically, but here's the gist of it. Go read the article. But Tom went back to the last, I think, 10 years of the NFL And it basically just shows analytically, go read the piece, that dink and dunk, those kind of offenses and quarterbacks that operate those kind of offenses, it simply means they're better at – it improves your odds of moving the chains on on third down is the the bottom line. gives you better odds. When you get to third down, you're in much favorable uh, distance situations to actually attack and not be dictated to so much by – the defense because Zach, when you're at third and 11, third and eight, third and nine, whatever, you're not really dictating anymore. It's the other way around. I'm going to let you all in on a secret though. Uh, do you know what sells tickets and do you know what gets networks attention and what makes teams relevant is winning? Number freaking one is winning. You know what aids winning is scoring points, scoring touchdowns. That That's the number one way is to outscore the opponent. That's an old John Maddenism. So I really don't care, and I mean this legitimately, I don't care if they need 20 plays to score a touchdown or one play to score a touchdown. I just want to see touchdowns. I just want to see winning. If dinking and dunking is the way to go, if they will utilize their weapons and, and score touchdowns, I am fine with that. That's genuinely how every Broncos fan should feel. Just make the sausage. We don't care how it gets made, all right? Just get that sausage made. Uh, B Zuck, very cool. He says, I'm catching this live uh, on Twitch. First time, usually watches on YouTube. Hey, we appreciate you spreading the love around to some of the different platforms we stream to. Shout out to Michael for the stars leading the way tonight. First place, Claude right behind him. Thank you, buddy. Lawrence Rivera, Gary Leeds Palmer, the legend. Andrew Baker, Melvin Paulson, who has come on strong quite a lot the last month or so as a contributor here. 
and Andrew Morrow. Appreciate you guys. We are obviously keeping a keeping an eye out for your topics and questions in the chat. Trevor, appreciate that, my brother. He's trying to keep the Tedham hate it doesn't work <laughs> alive, and uh, I don't hate it. Zach, Zach, it's still you know percolating in Zach's brain. <laughs> Y'all need something else to associate with Teddy Bridgewater. I, the fives don't do it for me like the threes do. But um, all right, let me see here. I'm just gonna scroll, try and get to as many. Here's Gary. What up, Gary? Good to see you, bro. Um, yeah, just throw it up. Just throw it up there. Let's let's grab uh, Brandon here. What's going on, buddy? Bama Broncos. We are going to be just fine at quarterback. I just worry about Vic Fangio and Pat Shermer screwing up a wet dream. Yeah, I mean, we listen, buddy. We have our doubts about this coaching staff. Okay, uh, we're not going to stand up here and lie to you. All right, but at the same time, let's not pretend as if Vic Fangio is some incompetent buffoon. Let's not pretend as if Pat Shermer is some incompetent buffoon. You know, look, Vic Fangio, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised he kept his job after John Elway sacrificed himself and stepped down. I mean, I've never I, – I can't even think of the last time I saw someone in a pro sport fire themselves. You know what I'm saying? Like, I know he's still got his job as president of football operations and it's one last year uh, in the front office or whatever, but like that really surprised me, but he did so to preserve, I think Vic Fangio fine. Vic did get a raw deal last year with the pandemic. Like so many um, first and second year coaches that were trying to kind of get their stamp on their team ingrained and, you know, try and build on what their first year was. It was tough. That, that wasn't fair. All right. I get it. It wasn't fair for Vic, but he still was not equal to the opportunity. He had a lot of bad luck with the injury bug. And so I'm trying to maintain an optimistic posture on Vic this year, hoping that time on task, live bullets, experience, trial and error taught him something. Because I am, Zach, of the opinion that as a human being, we learn more all right, from our failures than we do our successes generally speaking. So if that's the case, Vic Fangio should have a PhD now at being a head coach in the league. Let's see it come out on the wash. Yeah, nothing worse than screwing up a wet dream. You know, I wouldn't say Fangio's a buffoon. Obviously, he's not. I mean, he's a really great defensive mind. But as a head coach, you really question whether he is the right guy for the job. I mean, he doesn't. His situational mismanagement is on record. His timeout mismanagement is on record. Him focusing almost solely on the defense while ignoring the offense in real time is on record. And then in the offense's hands, and, and Vic Fangio has a head coach of the offense in Pat Shermer, that head coach, it's not Matt LaFleur, it's not Kyle Shanahan, it's Pat Shermer, a twice-fired head coach in the NFL. So I understand the apprehension. That's why Teddy Bridge. I'll say this over and over and over again this year, Teddy isn't my biggest worry. My biggest worry are his coaches. We'll see how it shakes out, <clears throat> and we're going to get our first uh, piece of the evidence uh, in just a, a few days' time. It's really crazy to think opening week is already here. Phenomenal. Randy, thank you for the stars, brother. Really appreciate you finishing first in the uh, actual rankings for the Von Miller goal of 500 k You're going to have a lot of tickets in the hat. That's all I know. We'll see how it shakes out Wednesday night. Uh, Joshua Hickey, what's good, buddy? Thank you for the super. He says the Broncos have been allergic to play action and bootlegs since Shanny left. Bill Musgrave in, uh, irrationally ignored it with Keenum. True, that was so bizarre. And now Shermer uh, and Locke. So, so help me God if they do the same with Teddy. Uh, yeah, bro. I mean, play action should be a staple in every offense. It doesn't matter what uh, the particular skill set, strengths, weaknesses are of your quarterback, even if they're not very mobile. I mean, shoot. Gary Kubiak came in here in 2015 and said, look, Peyton, um, we're going to run my offense, all right, instead of the other way around. But to accommodate you, because I know we need to have a plausible threat, we're going to throw the ball a heck of a lot. But still, to accommodate you and to present the plausible threat that we could be running on any given down, I'm going to put you in the pistol a lot, all right? And some of those pistol play action plays, man, they were laborious. They were, it was weird to watch sometimes, but Peyton Manning, not the most mobile fleet of foot quarterback. Hey, he found a way, you know, he made it work. You just need those play fakes. What's the purpose of it? It gets defenders, right? Their eyes locking in on what's happening 
up front on that play fake. Cause if it's a handoff, I got to get up there and do my job. And that very split second is all it really takes of a defender getting caught peeking a little bit. Linebackers suck up safety might bite down. Boom. The, the routes can do their job and the quarterback can exploit. You don't have to be the greatest at it, Zach, but you just have to have it as a part of the repertoire. And yes, it was stunning how much Bill Musgrave ignored that when Keenum was here. I'm sorry, but celebrating an offensive coordinator calling play action is like celebrating a mathematician for doing addition. It it is literally the staple of an offensive playbook. It's play action. And it's not just like you mentioned uh, Bill Musgrave, but what's so frustrating is that Pat Shermer will show it every now and then. He'll run play action, and it always works without fail. In the Minnesota game in week one of the preseason, Locke was feasting off play action. That 80-yard touchdown to Hamler, off play action. What happened the next week? He went completely back into his shell, Pat Shermer. No play action, shotgun, uh, 11 personnel, three wide receivers on the field, 11 and 12 personnel mixing that up. No creativity, the 2020 version of Pat Shermer. You know who called a lot of play action? Rich Scangarello. Where is he now? Not in Denver. Andrew Baker, appreciate you, bro. He says, this defense, though, we were ninth in sacks last year with an injured crew. I'm hoping at least three sacks, two picks, and maybe a fumble this first game. Hey, man, you know, Daniel Jones, I mean, that situation is rife for opportunity for a defense that wants to fancy itself, Zach, as being opportunistic. You can get to him. You can rattle him. Von Miller, Bradley Chubb, and even if it isn't Chubb, I I can't remember who said it in the chat I saw, but someone said something to the effect of Chubb, you know, being banged up again is going to screw around and see Jonathan Cooper take his job and make him, you know, basically obsolete in Denver. That's a way too early in my opinion to say that. All right. But if Chubb's not able to play fully uh, in New York, Cooper will help out. Malik Reed will help out. At least Vaughn's there, right? Let's just all pray. Everything continues to go according to plan for Vaughn and his recovery, because that alone, Zach can force some really, um, dangerous type of decisions and throws on the part of Daniel Jones, where guys like Kyle Fuller, PS2, Bryce Callahan, Darby, Simmons, Kareem, they can they can make him pay. I'm going to be honest. I don't think the Broncos need Bradley Chubb to beat the Giants. I'm not saying they shouldn't have him out there or shouldn't play him, but I don't think they need his services in order to con- conquer Daniel Jones. They don't need anyone. If you let Daniel Jones run, what's he going to do? He's going to literally fall down. I mean, he's that type of quarterback. He is a buffoon. He's a turnover-prone buffoon quarterback that the Broncos should spit up and chew out every single drive of that game. They should have no issue. I don't want to hear it. Uh, Joseph says, it's only a matter of time before Drew Locke becomes the starter, plus less pressure on Locke, and it will show it wasn't all on Locke. We'll see, man. We'll see. I don't know if that holds true. Um, Zach, I would assume Drew probably is I trying to maintain an optimistic perspective that he is going to uh, play again in Denver, but only time will tell. Yeah, I disagree, Joseph, with, you know, you're saying it's when and not if. It's definitely if for Drew Locke. You know, this is Teddy Bridgewater's team now. We all know about how Fangio feels about him. George Payton literally said he gravitates toward Teddy Bridgewater, and now the players in the locker room are gravitating toward Teddy. So it's going to take an injury or cataclysmic play on Bridgewater's part. And I don't think he's that terrible enough or inconsistent enough to be that bad. So he might play Drew this season. He might but I would not bet on that at all. By the way, it was Leroy with the uh, Chubb mess around and give Jonathan Cooper a chance. Jonathan Cooper, for what it's worth, he does strike me as the type of cat that, you know, he capitalizes on his opportunities. So if I'm Bradley Chubb, you know, I'm not trying to miss any time. I don't absolutely have to miss. Uh, Michael, you the man, dude. Appreciate you. Um, All right, let me see. We're at uh, 39 minutes. Let me see what else is on everybody's mind here. Um. <laughs> All right. Yeah, Claude says, "Hey, man, caught Broncos book club on my lunch today. Great. If extra content, that and Kelberman's Corner alone worth the five bucks a month. Keep up the great work. Glad to hear that, brother. Really appreciate it." Um, Chase needs to know this relative to the fantasy league, Zach. If you want to answer when those who are in the league need to pony up the cashola for the league. 
Well, I've had a, a lot of different problems because I wanted Venmo, but some don't have Venmo. Some want PayPal, some want Zelle, some want Cash App. I mean, there's a, a lot of confusion. It's tough to manage so many different people's finances and ask them to dip in in, in that way. So in lieu of a buy-in this year, I'm going to have it a free league. Everyone's already in. The draft is tomorrow night, guys, at 6 o'clock Mountain, 8 o'clock Eastern. Tomorrow night, be there. Don't forget. Um, but in lieu of a buy-in, I'm gonna have we're gonna have really cool prizes for the first, second, and third place winner, including the first place winner. I have something that's better than winning cash. Bet on that. Also, guys, so next year it's gonna be mandatory. If you want in the league, you gotta have a Venmo account. Yes. And I mean, it's almost universal. If you don't have a Venmo account, it, you're getting to a point now where it's like, how do you function in society if you don't have Venmo? So, you know, anyway, food for thought. Zebulon, what's going on, buddy? He says, you can take all the deep shots you want, uh, and it will work against the Giants, but you got to actually hit against the big-time teams like KC. They aren't going to be worried about giving up one play, knowing Teddy won't hit on most of them. I wouldn't count those chickens um, before they've hatched on the Giants because the calling card, their strong suit is that defense, very underrated defense. So don't sleep on the Giants' defense, especially being at home. I don't know what the uh, latest is on New York relative to the pandemic and fan attendance and all that stuff, but if they have their fans there, hey, dude, it's going to be a freaking hostile environment, and that that's a defensive team right now. I'm not worried about the Broncos' defense in this game. I think they're going to smother Daniel Jones and the Giants and a recovering and returning Saquon Barkley. I'm worried for the reasons you just laid out. It's a new Broncos offense, a new quarterback, a lot of different moving pieces. Sutton coming back on a pitch count and all these different uh, offensive linemen they have with Teddy now, different combinations there. I'm worried about that Giants' defense. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but they finished last season, the second half of the season, statistically among the top, I think the top 10 in the NFL. So it's not chop liver in New York. They're gonna, they might have some problems, and that's where if it becomes a 13-10 type game, a 16-13 type game, is, is Bridgewater your guy to get you over the hump there? So it, it could be closer than people are thinking. Hey, B. Zuck, appreciate you. Guys, this whole thing about we should be running play action on each and every play, Play action only works if you have a running game going. It, it works on top of the running game. So more than anything, instead of like praying and hoping for a viable play action game, I mean, you want that, don't get me wrong, but first let's, let's sit here and, and, and send positive energy into the football universe that this offensive line is going to be some dogs out there. That Melvin Gordon and Pookie Williams are going to freaking rock this year because if those – Two things come together in unison. The play action game, what regardless of how often it's utilized, is going to be dangerous. It, it will just be a criminal offense, uh, punishable by prison time, if this running game gets going and with this plethora of receiving weapons, if Pat Shermer is, is just so against and apprehensive to call play action. I, I, I pray at the very minimum he can at least get that through his mind. All right, let me see where everybody's at here. Stand by. I just want to try and get to as many of our peeps as possible. Brittany, what's good? Thanks for being with us tonight. How do you think we'll do against our division rivals? Great question. Um, you know, it's pretty um, laborious. When I first got into digital sports media, uh, the first job I had in this in this business, a paid gig, the uh, network mandated that we do full game by game season predictions. You know, who's going to win this game, Broncos or this team? Blah blah blah. blah. And they're kind of fun to write, but they are laborious. Funny thing about it, very few fans read those because everybody knows. Hey, if you really knew you wouldn't be sitting here on, on the internet writing about it. You'd be living high on the hog, right? Somewhere in Vegas, uh, you know, counting your chips. So we don't, we, we decided not to get too far into the whole predicting the, the season and the record and all that stuff. I think this is a team that can go somewhere like eight, win somewhere between eight and 10 games this year with Teddy or with Drew. As it relates to the AFC West, that's going to be the toughest thing about it, honestly, because 
you know, this is finally they got a favorable strength of schedule overall. I think if what is exactly like middle of the pack, basically in the league after in the pre- previous two seasons, being in the top two and the top five hardest schedules, despite being struggling teams, they got the second and I think it was fifth strength of schedule, tough stuff. But this AFC West is what really makes it more uh, fraught with peril because a, you got the chiefs who you have not beat since week two of the 2015 season. And you got the Raiders who, you know, you managed to split with them each and every year post Super Bowl 50 until last year when you let them sweep you. And then you've got the up and coming Chargers who split with you last year. And really, you should have been swept if it's not from a Herculean effort by Drew Locke and a really badass run by Philip Lindsay in the third quarter that basically sparked that shift in momentum. You probably 0 2 to the Chargers too with a rookie quarterback. So, it's going to be tough, but I think this team is now set up and poised, Zach, personnel-wise, defense, offense. There's just more balance and depth across the board. To be more dominant, effective in the league, but we'll see, or in the in the division. Yeah, I mean, especially when if they're going to be competing for a wild card, there it very well could be the case where two or three teams come out of the AFC West. So you have a contender in Herbert and the Chargers. You have even a contender with Derek Carr and Jacobs and Waller and Ruggs there in Vegas if their defense can just play at a, a competent level. To give a more specific prediction, I, I genuinely, guns in my head, I think the Broncos split with all three of those teams. I do think they'll take down Kansas City because a lot of Broncos fans and fans in general act like Kansas City is literally unbeatable, like they're an impervious machine that can't be taken down. Well, the Buccaneers kind of gave the game plan in February how to take down Mahomes in Kansas City. Easier said than done, but if the Broncos ever had the horses to do so, they have them this year. I'm not scared of Herbert. I don't... I'm not, you know, crowning him a top five quarterback just yet. They literally beat him last year. I'm really never scared of Derek Carr. They would have split with Vegas if Vic Fangio didn't have his head in his posterior. So if the stars align and they play and coach to potential, I think they go, what would it be, three and three against the division? Kevin Smith, longtime superstar, rocking his MHH face mask. And a great actor, his too. Football priest hat. Yeah, we we'll love the movies, the uh, View Askew universe, phenomenal. Jay and Silent Bob, Strike Back. Kevin, you know you the man, dude. Really Thank appreciate so that much. generosity. He says, win or lose, I'm just glad football season is here. Yes, sir. Go Broncos. Yes, indeed, Zach. And it's been, you know, I don't want to, like, open up a can of worms by any means, but it's been a pretty hectic, um, maybe not as hectic as 2020 was, but in the world at large with some of the things going on, especially lately, man, it's been hectic. It's going to be good to have that escape that entertainment that it's not just an escape football right because it also brings you together like we are doing like we're doing here tonight brings you together with other people united on a common cause and it's just the spice of life so we're right there with you kevin i mean not just professionally but personally it's very much life to me I'm not a summer kind of guy, so I'm happy it's fall now, football season, the air's getting a little crisper. I'm so happy we have a normal season with fans in the stands and the pandemic behind us. So, Kevin, I'm right there with you. Thank God it's football season. Here we got Dale Rude jumping in. What's going on? Longtime superstar, MHH Mount Rushmore superstar, single-handedly responsible for my teenage son's entire summer entertainment. You demand, Dale. He says, "Hey, priest, it's almost football time. Here's hoping. Uh, here's to hoping to improve coaching. I want to see an aggressive offense and defense. I know it won't happen. Well, hey, man, you know it's like uh, one of my mentors taught me: if you say you're going to do it, you will. If you say you're not going to do it, it's not going to happen. You, you know, Yoda maybe boiled it down a little bit better: do or do not. There, there is no try, right? But the point being." If you put out, I know it's not going to happen into the universe, then, it, you know, universe might say, okay, cool, here you go. The law of attraction. Anyone read The Secret? Exactly. I was right, going to pull up that. Yeah. I'm getting a little bit corny here, but it's no, true. I live by The book. Secret. Great book. When I was in college, here's a quick anecdote, and then I'll grab you, Lawrence. When I was in college, all right, I had this little phone job, of, you know, t- some telemarketing deal, and... um Every single day, you know, we'd go out to, we'd go to lunch or whatever. And this dude I worked with at the time, you know, this was a place, a building where there's like 200, 250 people working there 
in these cubicles and stuff, right? So when you go out to to lunch and stuff, I mean, you're like in a traffic jam just trying to get out of the freaking parking lot. But this dude, I go out to lunch with him for the first time, and uh, we hop in his car. And as he's backing out of his spot, and he's you know pretty close to the front door of the building, Zach, as he's backing out, he's like, like staring at the spot. Finally, I'm like, dude, what is that about, bro? Let's go. And he goes, oh, I'm just visualizing it. I'm like, why are you visualizing the spot, dude? He goes, the secret. I'm like, what's the secret? And so later he gave me the book. But basically what he explained to me was I'm putting out into the universe. I'm visualizing. I'm picturing that this spot is going to be here for me when we get back from lunch. And I'm like, fat chance, my friend. No way in hell that there, that's going to be there when we get back. He's like, we, we'll see, man. It's the law of attraction. Sure enough, dude, we go to lunch, come back. Freaking spots right there. Boom, right back in. And I'm telling you right now, those odds were low. So that shows you the secret. All right, Lawrence, who's our standout in this next game? Uh, who should we focus on the ball to? All right, so who's our standout? Uh, we, got, we got like an MVP question from Michaela on this same topic yesterday, Zach. Yeah. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and give you the, the same or you know close to the same answer. I think it's got to be uh, Teddy in this game. Doesn't mean he's got to be 350 yards and four touchdowns, zero picks. But Teddy needs to be your guy this week. Uh, be, even if it's like, you know, Melvin Gordon and Pookie combined for 150 yards, Teddy needs to get out there and do what he does best, and that is be a leader and a game manager, be efficient, move the chains when the chips are down, and let the talent around you do the heavy lifting. That's all I want to see. I don't need to see Teddy go be Peyton Manning circa 2013 against the Ravens in the season opener, throwing seven touchdowns. I just need to see Teddy operate that bad boy, you know, butter the bread where it needs to be buttered. In other words, distribute the ball to the guys who can wreck some shop and let it happen. Speaking of wet dreams, Chad. Yeah, I I gave Javante Williams yesterday as my MVP because, again, this offense in game one, maybe even for the first quarter of the year, it's going to be hopefully predominantly a ground game, ground and pound, wear the defense out, score touchdowns, and let the defense close out games. So if that happens, I'm putting my money on Javante, not Melvin Gordon. I think, obviously, Javante is the future. But to give you one more name, I I would say the whole Broncos secondary because – with or without Bradley Chubb, having Von Miller out there, Draymond, Shelby, and the rest, they should be getting significant pressure on Daniel Jones. And he is so prone to turning the ball over. So the entire defense should feast. But the secondary should be the benefactor here. And I look for Justin Simmons to continue what was an interception-filled preseason and maybe pick off a few of Daniel Jones's balls. Pause. I'm going to grab Savage Boy Kev here and then uh, DeAngelis Jones on Facebook. Kev says, uh, even if the coaches do fantastic this year, do we really pass up on Brian Dayball, uh, the coach, offense coordinator for the Buffalo Bills? I really want him, especially to develop Locke. Hey, dude, the Locke ship sailed, my dog. I'm, I, when I say I hate to be the bearer of bad news, believe me that when I mean that, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but barring some miraculous twist of fate, twist of football fate, that ship sailed, Broncos, told you they don't view drew lock as the future of this team anymore and as it relates to day ball if the coaches do fantastic that means the team won a lot of games no one's changing that right. equation so you know look if the broncos struggle fangio gets fired zach and i are right here with you go do what you can to get day ball i doubt it will do anything to save drew to be honest with you uh depending on how things shake out between now and then and whether that miracle gets poured out from the windows of football heaven It'll be about day ball. Tell us which quarterback in the draft you like, and let's exactly. go. Let's go get your guy. Exactly. It, it wouldn't be developing Locke. It would be developing the next Broncos quarterback, who we don't obviously know who that is. Uh, but yeah, if Vic and company do fantastic, that would mean they have probably a nine, ten win, maybe playoff season. In that case, Fangio is coming back, and they're damn sure not getting day ball as OC. That's going to be the hottest name on the head coaching circuit. So it's either you fire Fangio. Or, you know, you, you go forward with him and pass on Dayball. So, all, not about Drew Locke anymore. Not about, or Bridgewater for that matter. The next quarterback next year will be the primary focus for the, whoever the coach is. DeAngelis. Am I saying your name right, bro? Let me know. But uh, appreciate you. He says, how can I buy some merch? HuddleUpPod.com. Not HuddleUpPodcast.com. HuddleUpPod.com. Anything you want there, get your swag on, get a hat, get a t-shirt. I just put the link in the chat or just navigate on your browser, huddleuppod.com. 
And then now we have a chicken that has come home to roost on my part because Dale defending his position is throwing one of my catchphrases right back into my teeth. Chad, the best predictor of future behavior relative to the coaching staff, right? Uh, best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. And yes, very true. All I'm trying to say to you is hope for the best plan for the worst. That, maybe that kind of contradicts what I was trying to say too. Either way, just be optimistic, my dog. I mean, the way I was raised was hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. Expect that, the worst. That's the right. That's that. That's that's the the way to say it. I think that's the way to go. Uh, Chase, appreciate the super chat, brother. Regardless of Drew, are you interested in Dayball? Yeah, dude. We're I like Dayball. He's up Who there for be? me. I think that's one thing uh, Zach and I are one hundred percent unified on. Um, you know, we'll see. I mean. It, who knows? Maybe Buffalo, maybe Josh Allen takes a massive step backward this year. I don't think so. But so long as Buffalo continues to be a force um, and that offense continues to do well with that young Q, he's going to be able to pick his poison. Like he's going to be able to call his shot, pick where he wants yeah. to go. Uh, I'd love to see him in Denver if the Broncos struggle and have to fire Vic. And based on what I saw in the preseason finale a few weeks ago, uh, the Buffalo offense picked up right where it left off. I saw I turned on the, the TV to a game, and I saw Josh Allen just firing a 35-yard frozen rope touchdown. So I'm interested, regardless of Drew Locke, regardless of how Josh Allen does, you have to take a shot. You have to go in a different direction if it doesn't work out. You try two defensive-minded head coaches in a row. That's not the way to go. Whether it's Dayball, Greg Roman, Kellen Moore, Eric Bieniemy, they have to pick someone from that specific tree. All right, guys. It's about time for us to uh, dip on out of here. But before we do say goodnight for now, we'll be back obviously Wednesday. We'll do the raffle. It's going to be tons and tons of fun. Zach, we got to give a shout out to and also an update on how tonight's leaderboard on Facebook Shook out. Michael, finishing first. Hey, love seeing that, my friend. Down there in Tucson, Arizona, repping the squad and the brand. Love you, Michael. Claude, right there. Randy, legendary. Lawrence Rivera, dude, thank you. That's very, very generous. Andrew Baker, Gary Leeds Palmer. Guys, you, you, you're you making us proud. Melvin, thank you, brother. Andrew Morrow and DeAngelis, appreciate you guys. We really do appreciate you. And Zach, before you sign us off and go through a couple of quick reminders and matters of business, we got to remind everybody, all right? And we got to say thanks to our sponsor, BetQL, all right? It's the only app you all need to beat your sports book. Find their information along with a 25% discount code in the description of the video. It's discount code MHH. Also, check out the special BetMGM offer in the description, all right, in order to receive a free year of BetQL and other sportsbook sign-up offers and bonuses. Yeah, we are uh, off for t tonight, though. Uh, as you can see, we're approaching. We're at 58 minutes. We're at the Vaughn minute right now. We have two more minutes, so I'm going to go through the quick matters of business for you guys. If you haven't already, till we see you guys next time, be sure to follow the pod on Twitter at HuddleUpPod. You can follow the main account on Twitter for your Broncos news, analysis, rumors, transactions, film breakdowns, anything you can imagine is right there at Mile High Huddle. You can follow Chad on Twitter at Chad and Jensen. You can follow myself at Kelberman NFL. If you haven't already, go to huddleuppod.com and get your swag on. Get yourself a football priest hat, shirt, coffee mug, gator, hoodie, etc., etc. Everything is there. Also, facebook.com slash Mile High Huddle. Big blue button. Become a supporter. Five bucks a month, guys. Again, it's one less trip to Starbucks. It's one gallon of gas in today's climate. I promise you, three exclusive shows waiting for you when you do subscribe. Kelberman's Corner, Broncos Book Club, Trickle Zone. We appreciate your patronage. Also, facebook.com slash Pod. Like that page and follow that page. And, guys, if you haven't already... Apple Podcasts, leave your five-star review for your football priest for your chance to win some swag every single month. Apple Podcasts, leave us a five-star review. We appreciate each and every one of you. But if you can't do any of that, we still love you. We still appreciate and respect you. Do these three things. Subscribe to this video, like this video, and share this video. And each and every video you see on the MHH channel helps us grow and reach more Broncos fans just like you and bring them into the huddle. We are off, though. Chad, until tomorrow night. I hope you have a great night. Everyone have a great Monday night, rest of your Labor Day. We are off until Wednesday evening. 
6 o'clock Mountain, 8 o'clock Eastern. And those who are in the league, tomorrow, 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 tomorrow night, Tuesday night, September 7th, 6 o'clock Mountain, 8 o'clock Eastern, Fantasy Football Draft. Everyone's locked in. Everyone's ready to go. And I can't wait to draft with y'all. Take care, guys. Until we see you guys next time, go Broncos. You've been listening to the Huddle Up Podcast. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com to keep the conversation going.